time. Are we supposed to be on mute? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll keep waiting for, um, we'll wait about two or three minutes for folks to get settled in. Okay. Side note, I started watching The Last of Us. Oh, yeah. I didn't get past the first episode. Oh, like, mm. <laughs> I get nervous, so that's why I don't finish. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's those the zombies on that. I, I never watched the show, but I played the game. Oh. Uh, I was like, oof. <laughs> I didn't, I think I got. Like I'm, I was in the first episode, and then once the girl walked in the house, I was like, "Oh no, I got to turn this off." <laughs> I was like, "I got to turn this off." I saw somebody, uh, you, though. I saw somebody talking about like the difference between like Walking Dead zombies, like okay, that type of zombie apocalypse, I could survive, but like the I Am Legend zombies, like. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna try my best to like at least get through episode one. We'll see. All right, I think we're, um, I think we're good to go. Yeah. So, welcome everybody um, to our I Pull Rank Black History Month webinar: Influence the Impacts of Black Culture on the Marketing Industry. I am here with my colleagues. My name is Aaron Johnson, I'm the Senior Digital Marketing Specialist here at I Pull Rank. And I have my colleagues here with me. Would you guys like to int introduce yourselves? My name is Nafakara. I am the Office and Special Projects Manager here at Apple Rank. I'm Vital Parker, I'm the Account Manager here at Apple Rank. Hey, I'm Chantel Branch, Director of Client Strategy at Apple Rank. Yeah, so I Pull Rank is a black owned uh, marketing agency. We primarily focus in SEO um, and we work with clients in a variety of industries, um, publishers, as well as um, we also work with um, Darn a Blank, but we work with <laughs> we work with media companies, publishers, finance um, on SEO as well as content. Um, so we put together this webinar to just showcase how black culture has been extremely influential in the marketing in industry over the years um, and continues to be that despite um, low numbers in uh, African Americans within the marketing industry, especially in executive positions. Um, so without further ado, let's jump in and just talk about how influential black culture really is. So let's go through the history of black culture and marketing and just like what that actually looks like. And we'll start with print. So needing really no introduction, of course, we'll kick it off with Jet Magazine, um, which began publishing in 1952 under John H. Johnson's um, publishing company. Um, and it actually garnered national attention through its coverage of Emmett Till. So, Jet Magazine actually published photos of Emmett Till's body inside of the magazine, um, which drew national attention and got national coverage for Emmett Till's murder, as well as the, the ongoing case coverage. Um, and so Jet co covered everything from politics to entertainment to sports, um, social commentary on Black issues. Um, it was really just a, a pivotal magazine, especially during that period um, through the civil rights movement. Um, you can see images, um, if you Google online, of folks like Martin Luther King and Dick Gregory um, speaking at different, uh, at, at different venues, and you'll see Jet Magazine on the podium. Um, so it's really cool that this publication was able to be such a pivotal part of all of, all of the things that were happening at that time. Do you guys remember <laughs> Jet Magazine? Oh, I mean, obviously. <laughs> um, I, I think it's great too that, that there was a space for ads for um, Black people, as Black people are 
especially in America, are part of a capitalist country. So we buy things and we would love to be spoken to. And Jet Magazine, in addition to being a great place for news, gave places the opportunity to offer large and small businesses to offer their wares to us through advertising and marketing. And that was pretty cool too. Yeah. I remember getting um, a subscription to Jet Magazine for one of my birthdays. Um, and I think that they actually um, republished um, like the photos from Emmett Till's funeral on one of his anniversaries too as well. So I actually think I have the, the, the republished one somewhere. So, yeah. Wow. Yeah, I remember Jet being one of the first magazines I consumed, right? Like the first pieces of print copy ads, whatever you want to call it, that I really interacted with. And I, I think that it was so good that it appealed to all black people, really everybody, but like I could read it from the time I was a young kid, right? And I understood it and I, I learned things. Like I wasn't just looking, flipping through the pictures, right? Like I was, you know, like <laughs> seeing the things my parents were talking about that, you know, my aunts and uncles were talking about and being able to formulate my own opinions and read my own, you know, info on it. It's a pretty great um, little powerful piece because it was not only news, not only art, but it was also lifestyle. And that's pretty great. And then culture, you know, the idea of having like, you know, if you were crowned Miss Howard, that appearing there, or if you got married. Um, I don't know when Black couples started to be invited to the New York Times wedding pages, but, you know, in Jet Magazine, you could be in the wedding pages, anything that was related to any Black Greek organizations, you can find that stuff there, or any other organizations, any ACP. It's pretty great. Pretty cool. Yeah. Cute little, cool little uh, staple of our lives. Absolutely. Jet was Jet was huge. I, I there was not for me. I you know, my my parents were subscribed, but there also wasn't really a, a black space that you could go to and not see a Jet magazine in, mm -hmm. in on inside of a barbershop. It was kind of everywhere, um, <laughs> and that that I'm and I'm sure it was even more prevalent. Um, throughout the 60s, 70s, and 80s, because I'm I'm a 90s baby. So um, <laughs> I, I know that, that Jet was e even bigger at that time. And then another one of the the sister uh, <laughs> the, the sister magazines was Ebony Magazine, um, which was launched in 1945, um, pretty much two months after World War II ended. Um, it was created to chronicle um, a specific vision of the American dream, specifically our American dream um, within the Black community. Um, and it was launched underneath, of course, John H. Johnson's um, publishing company as well. And this also ran and kind of chronicled all, you know, all of our events in the Black community from, you know, things like, of course, the March on Washington, um, mm -hmm. well, the March on Mon Montgomery, throughout the entire civil rights movement, and then up to things like Obama getting elected, they really did um, push forward uh, just like the Black community as a whole. And some of those advertisements, as you were talking about, Chantel, that were published inside of magazines like Ebony and Jet usually range, you know, across, especially in the beginnings, they ranged across a number of products that were being pushed to Black people. And a lot of them were owned by you know black businesses that were able to advertise inside of these um, inside of these publications, and they were I feel like they were just like super super culturally significant. Do you guys have any memories of uh, Ebony Magazine? Well, anybody who is of a black American household may more likely than not had coffee tables with what would be library quality. Um, archives of uh, Ebony Magazine because they make for good decoration, everything everything on the cover. Um, I don't know if you guys, and it's kind of like ties into like the marketing thing, but um, Budweiser was a big advertiser with um, Ebony. And at certain points in time, they would do like these posters. Because remember, Budweiser is the king of all beers, right? So they had a poster, um, campaign where you could cut out the little the little thing and order posters of African kings. 
to be mailed to your house from Ebony Magazine, but it was like co-branded with wow. Budweiser. And then like, depending on how, the type of family you had, that would be like people you would learn about. So like, so they would come in the mail and then someone would be like, this is this thing. And like, now you're learning something. Um, and I, it's an interesting co-brand and marketing strategy. I don't know who came up with that specific campaign, but it's interesting that like Budweiser, Ebony Magazine was like teaching little black kids like me about like the Kings in Africa. It's pretty cool. Yeah, it's an amazing campaign. Yeah, I mean, they would. All, it was always like something to cut out because, you know, before the internet was like ubiquitous, <laughs> you had to like order things in the mail and Ebony Magazine was really good for like selling you stuff. Yeah, yeah. I can remember uh, specifically, this is the only memory that I have of Ebony Magazine like that like kind of sticks in my brain is specifically ripping out an ad. I think I'm pretty sure it was a Gatorade ad, a Michael Jordan ad. Um, because I, I wanted a Michael Jordan poster, but we didn't have one at the time. So I ripped mm -hmm. it out. Um, and I kept that. I don't, it's, you know, long gone in an apartment somewhere in New York. But mm -hmm. <laughs> um, that that was like that it, in my in my brain, I can still remember as a kid opening that Ebony magazine, ripping it out. I'm sure my mother was probably pissed that I had ripped a magazine, but um, <laughs> And they were really good with a lot of cross branding because then you have like um, Fashion Fair, which was also owned by the Johnson family. So they would co brand in that and they would advertise like the makeup. Um, and then they would have the Ebony Jet showcase, which was like a fashion showcase. Yeah. And like Mrs. Johnson traveled to Europe and was able to get some like couture brands to come and let Black women walk in their garments but in these fashion shows and that was like her big thing and she gave a lot of people who became like well-known black supermodels opportunities by having those ebony jet showcases and i don't know if you guys remember the um newscaster sue simmons from channel four in new york mm -hmm. but she was a model as well for the ebony jet showcase um if you guys don't know who Sue Simmons is. She's I didn't really watch Channel 4, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> or my parents or whoever didn't watch it. Yeah, also, I, and it's funny because I come from a family, like wherever there were Black people, that is where we went. So like, if there was a Black person on Channel 4, then now we watch Channel 4 because there's a Black newscaster. So like, like follow it. So even to like, there's Black people on Broadway. Like, I guess we're going to see this play, even though it may not be what we want to see, <laughs> just to be supportive. Um, yeah. Yeah, so Sue Simmons was the mm -hmm. Channel 4 nightly news person for a long time, for like 25 years. She's like a really pretty lady. Um, I didn't know she was a model until later, but I can see it. Um, I think she's still with us, I believe. Fun fact, Fashion Fair was bought by two Black women and they're back. And I know. they're actually like in stores now um, and I think they just came out with like a lip gloss or something like that. So like, I remember my mom, she always worn fashion fair. And I remember one time she went into Macy's and they, she, they didn't have it anymore because they stopped production. And, um, like I surprised her with like, um, cause I actually went to like one of their events. So I surprised her with like one of their newer vegan lines. And, um, we went to Sephora, you know, to support and whatnot, but yeah. So for anyone that doesn't know, fashion fair is back. Yeah, my first lipstick was a fashion fair lipstick, mm -hmm. um, magenta. Um, that was a color choice. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I remember seeing a picture of it and I was just like, oh my God, I just like a little girl with lipstick on. And I was like 16, but I wasn't allowed to wear makeup until I was 16. Just lipstick, no makeup, but um, it was magenta. Yeah, that's called, that's influence. <laughs> that's what we're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> So of course, as we mentioned before, like Johnson Publishing, the the merger of uh, you know between Ebony and Jet, and the advertisements inside of these publications, it kind of it kind of shaped how corporations were going to leverage the black community um, and black part products in marketing and advertising, as you can kind of see in in this slide, you know. 
everything from, you know, Winston Churchill cigarettes to Coke and Pepsi. Um, inside of these publications, they were marketing strictly to black people um, because they knew the power that these publications had um, to reach the black audience. So it was just a really pivotal moment um, for marketing as a whole. So then we move on to Essence Magazine, which Essence Magazine was founded in 1968 as a lifestyle magazine that was just targeted specifically um, to black women. And I know for me personally, every black woman um, in, in my life personally had a subscription to this magazine. Um, every house that I walked into, it was there. <laughs> so, um, and uh, the publication covered controversial topics that include black politics, religion and sex and the criminal justice system. Um, and it gave a, a voice to a lot of black women, even in some of these other publication publications, um, it could be difficult for black writers to get their fair shake, particularly black women to get their fair shake in different publications. And so Essence Magazine drove um, that conversation and was, was also a place that platformed and featured original works from Maya Angelou and Nikki Giovanni. It just, again, it, it was like the hub for black women in print um, at the time. And so, I'm Nefakara <laughs> Shanto. Okay. Can can either of you kind of talk about uh, Essence Magazine and just like what what it was like for you growing up and experiencing that publication? Um, well, I still follow Essence um, online, and they do they're doing a great job. I think um, marketing themselves and kind of like making that pivot, and even like using memes, and they're just very. Um, present with different things that are happening within our community. I actually had a cousin that used to work at Essence. So um, that I think um, aside from Jet was a magazine that I was familiar with because I always reference my cousin working there with like, oh my God, it's, you know, it's Essence magazine. So yeah, um, I think that it's funny because I remember, I still have like a, a clipping from Essence where they had like, um, you know, like kind of like how to do your budget as a, a young woman and like even like um, just simple like recipes and whatnot. So um, I think that a lot of it for me spoke to more so um, uh, someone coming of age, I would say, more so than Ebony, at least for me. Yeah, uh, Essence Magazine was super ubiquitous. Um, I think if you really think about Essence, it was for the modern Black woman, whatever that means. Um, Essence Magazine was never in my grandmother's house because that wouldn't have been the kind of thing she would have looked at. But my mother always had an Essence Magazine. Like, as long as I can remember, we, we read that. Um, the hair salon always had it. There was always really great long form articles, not just um, reporting, but essays. Um, even most recently, I remember, I don't know if you guys know what the read is, but Crystal West wrote a long form essay in essence. It still has a pretty um, strong position in the community. And from a marketing perspective, Essence Music Festival, I'm sure that the city of New Orleans is like, what, 700,000 black ladies in their white outfits? and their wallets filled with money to spend, yes, please. And that, that event is like such an amazing event, specifically targeted to Black women, not Black people, Black women. And it manages to be like a multi-day event, multi-layered event focused like on entertainment and spirituality and entrepreneurship and drinking and drinking and drinking and more drinking and then more music and giving opportunity from like the smallest business to like the largest. And it's like such a rite of passage to go to Essence Festival. And then it becomes like, look, they made the movie Girls Trip about the Essence Festival. Like that's where they are. That's why they're there. That's how big that is. And that's like a huge event. Like think about it. What other publication do you know has like an ongoing, like survived hurricanes COVID and it's still still going. 
Yeah. I like the fact that they consciously made an effort to stay in New Orleans as well. So Yeah. 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 I mean, they did try Durban once. <laughs> We tried to spread it to South Africa. Um, mm -hmm. I think how local people went, they thought that was great. And they were in Houston while they were getting everything cleaned up at the Superdome. But even though it is truly the hottest time ever to be in New Orleans, it is, it is such a great experience. Um, there's so many opportunities to see things you wouldn't typically see and kind of like tie into the marketing, like people launch brands there. Other brands are like legacy brands that want to show their support for community. Um, and like I said, small business, like if you go to some, when you go to like the, um, convention center, there's like local businesses that are there and it's pretty cool. It's, it's a very, it's, I hate to use this term, but it's an event that doesn't seem to have ever sold out. It still is what it is, even though it's big, it's so big. Not going to so. <laughs> Incredible. So. Of course, another publication. We are I Pull Rank, and Mike King is our CEO, so we can't <laughs> we can't have a webinar like this without discussing music. Um, and so, XXL Magazine was huge, a huge, huge publication in terms of hip hop culture um, and hip hop artists. Um, when it launched in 1997, uh, these two covers that are on here were actually the covers that they launched with, with Jay-Z and uh, Master P up at the top. And for, for me, I can remember um, with XXL, I can remember it was like when I was coming up, it was huge um, to be on that XXL freshman cover. Um, cause that was during the blog era when everybody was putting out free music. And so, um, every independent artist coveted that XXL fresh, freshman cover. And a lot of our favorite artists today went through the XXL freshman list. It was like a rite of passage, um, for, for, for artists that were coming up. It was like, if you didn't make the XXL freshman cover people weren't really trying to hear from you. And it was like, you know, a staple. So folks like J. Cole and Nipsey, um, even, you know, to other other artists who have kind of like entered into hip hop to today, you know, people still do the whole XXL freshman freestyles. Um, but XXL was gigantic um, when I when I was growing up. So uh, any memories that, that that you guys have from XXL magazine? Yeah, I think that, you know, we talk about all these magazines and Ebony and Jet, and one of the big, big plays of them is the nostalgia and the collectability aspect of things. And I remember in my house, we had like this big wicker basket full of like Jets and, and Essence and all things like that. But Double XL was the first one in my life where I was like, I would, I would pick one up from the newsstand and I would keep it. Like I, I wanted it fresh, pristine. It was sitting on my coffee table when I had my apartment still on my table now and i'm and like so many of them like this 2010 freshman cover is probably my favorite freshman cover <laughs> I, I want this one so bad and to find it um just because so many of the people on there were some of my favorites um but yeah double xl is i think it, with it launching in 97 for us like 90s hip-hop babies like that's this is the one i grew up with for sure <laughs> So this is so funny because y'all keep saying y'all grew up in the 90s and that's not what I think. I don't, I don't, I feel like you mean born in the 90s? Yeah, right? born okay. in the 90s. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm like, wait. Yeah. Because I, I think a lot of people when, when you say, I, I think a lot of people when you say grew up, uh, they're thinking like probably like pivotal like teenage years. Um, <laughs> and for, for, for me, I'm I'm 92, so like most of the people who grew up in the 90s, I would say were born in the 80s. That's that's like a like, <laughs> like I, I grew up in the 90s, uh, but uh, got you. Okay, <laughs> and double XL is not the freshman cover because I'm not really clear when the freshman cover shows up. I read double XL. To I think 09 was the first one. Right. Was so I was reading one. like um, uh, when Elliot West, uh, Elliot Wilson was going by um, YN. And when Elliot Wilson was writing those editorials, because I was a journalism major, and a part of me wanted to write for these types of publications, 
So like, I like reading long form articles and like um, narratives and essays about hip hop. And Elliot Wilson's writing was so funny and so kind of like irreverent. And like, he was like shit talky in his like letters from the editor. And I just loved it. Um, and that's like to see him now, like hearing him on like Rap Radar and like hearing him sound exactly like the way that he was writing, like his written voice and the voice he actually speaks in, it's so dope to me that it's like a tight, tight, tight line. Um, and even to that point, his wife was also another really excellent journalist, hip hop journalist. Um, and Double XL, and I know I keep tr going back to the marketing parts, but I just, Think about like the back of Double XL and like all of the stuff that you could buy back there, <laughs> like the fake jewelry, the weeds, <laughs> um, like and then like all the clothing ads. So like obviously like these urban brands that we know like a Fubu or like um, like a Nietzsche, which I don't think that's how we're supposed to say it, but that's how we say it. So that's how I'm saying it. So like Iniche, Fubu, um, Maurice Malone, like all of those brands. And then there would be like these little brands that would have like the little quarter page ads. And I, I, I hope that they were doing well because that was an investment for them to get back there. But it gave them an opportunity to be seen. So if you did go into like a Jimmy Jazz or s and which I think is just a New York store, but like um, is s and just New York? I think so. Yeah. yeah. So like and stores like that, like urban wear stores um you would be able to see these brands that would be in double xl and like um like the alcohol ads so um i don't know if we, we talk we're going to talk about tv but like the print ads for like saint eyes which is not my preferred malt liquor but there was like a super tie into like hip-hop and like every artist getting like their saint eyes commercial and then the, their print ad so you'd see like ice cube Biggie Smalls, like all the way through, probably to like the early 2000s, where you would see these ads in these magazines. So it was just like layering on, layering on, layering on. So coming from Ebony, and like the Pepsi and like the Johnny Walker Red and like Winston cigarettes to like Double XLs, like little clothing ads to like the Newport ads to <laughs> the St. Eyes to all of the stuff. And not just terrible vice, but all kinds of things would be in there. I can't think of any cosmetic stuff. People always act like women don't listen to hip hop. So maybe <laughs> not a lot of ads targeted to the ladies. Fat farm, baby yes. fat. Yes. A lot of baby fat, <laughs> a lot of girlies with the cat. Um, that was a time. Um, so there was a lot of money probably running through these magazines to keep them I, open. Yeah. Because that's, that's that was a lot of ads. It was a lot of ads and it was a lot of long form. And a, a lot of major, uh, you know, a lot of people in music today went through, to your point, like outside of Elliot Wilson, went through XXL um, and are still at, you know, they are execs at record labels. I think Carl Cherry used to write for uh, XXL and he went to, he was the head of edit editorial playlists at Apple Music and then he moved over to Spotify. So like a lot of the people who were writing at XXL still kind of have a stranglehold on the music industry and like what's hot and what's not. Um, and so labels 100%, we're gonna talk about some of these other magazines, but labels also use these as marketing machines. They paid um, to have their artists in some of these publications. There was controversy over XXL freshman covers because they were wondering like if there was any payola going any, uh, going on with somebody sliding somebody money for these artists to get, uh, you know, to get preferential treatment. So it was a, it was a huge marketing platform, especially for um, the music industry and just hip hop culture. Um, another magazine is Vibe uh, that uh, was, uh, of course, founded by the music industry legend Quincy Jones. Um, but Vibe, Vibe magazine was a, a trailblazer publication um, that played a crucial role in the rise of hip hop culture in the mainstream. Um, I, I wasn't a huge Vibe person. I was more XXL in the source. But <laughs> with that being said, I would still flip through Vibe magazine when I would go to the barbershop. Um, and I would pick up magazines just to look through them. And I always found it so interesting, like, that, you know, for me, I, you know, came up at a time where all of these, you know, publications were competing for, you know, a, for a space in it. 
uh, in music. And so there, there was a, there's a uniqueness to the way that XXL approached how they covered hip hop versus how Vibe or some of the other publications um, covered it. It was just a super, super pivotal time at that time for uh, for just black culture, black media, and especially uh, hip hop and R&B music um, during the 90s and early 2000s. I think I can speak to this for you as a person who was there. Um, this is probably the first indicator of the growing up of hip hop and then taking things to the next level. So what's happening in what Liz is 97? Um, yeah. yeah, so some people are starting to elevate beyond their, beyond their humble beginnings. Yeah. And people are expanding. And this magazine was not just it wasn't rap pages. It wasn't like, you know, it wasn't the source. It wasn't like gritty. It wasn't going to be hip hop quotable. There might have been some quotables in there, but that wasn't the intention. The intention was more about the overall culture, the glamour, the women. There was giving space for women and not just like as accessory, but women as art, women as artists, women as voice, women as beauty. Um, and the men getting an opportunity to not just be hard, but also be fashionable. Because this is before you're going to see um, Puffy or um, Beyonce at the Met Gala. This is pre all of that. This is what gets them to be considered. Like this is where like the luxury ads start to come in, where you know the luxury brands were happy to receive the monies from some of these folks, but the interest to actually market to them um wasn't necessarily they had not been properly asked or they had maybe not been properly presented with the right information and if you read bevy smith's book she talks about being on the team that leads the um pursuit of ad dollars to luxury brands because that was her background and getting the first ad buys in vibe because vibe had luxury brands it's no no shade against like double xl or source or anybody else but like this magazine also based on the size it had the the size and stylings for like a what would be in vogue so you'd be able to have the same type of art fall into this into these pages and even the layouts were just really gorgeous the writing was super long form um you know you have kevin powell danielle smith elliot wilson's wife um i'm sure tori was there and like emil webkin was the editor-in-chief which you know he's a pretty big powerhouse as far as like hip hop journalism that doesn't exist anymore. There is no such thing as hip hop journalism. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> that sorry was for me as far well as the black guys. It's, just, um, it's a shame, but- <laughs> You're not wrong. <laughs> I don't know anywhere where you can find 5,000 words of, a, of an exploratory article that's based on an interview where somebody spends a week with someone to tell a really interesting story anywhere on planet Earth. Well, in America, maybe overseas, you're still seeing it, but unfortunately, that's not what we want. So I think it's just converted to more so video form. But I the think, video, huh? yeah, it's, you know, follow up question. <laughs> Aaron, <laughs> no, I'm saying, like, literally no one asked follow up questions. So it's just a video yeah. of people just speaking words. They're just monologuing. And since they're yeah. artists, they already share their thoughts and their music. Mm -hmm. So there's no one challenging anyone. And that's why we're doing this webinar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So another, another publication um, was The Source. And the source was something. The source was uh, founded in 1988. Um, and of course, it played a significant role in hip hop culture, black culture, and music. Um, but the source was really well known for its five mic reviews on albums. And I know that there was a ton of controversy. Uh, well, wait, 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 wait. wait. No, the, the source is very well known for their mic rating system. Yeah. How many yeah. albums got five mics? Not that many. Well, yeah, I mean, you got their ability to write two and a half mic reviews yeah. is where the art is. 
because <laughs> it's so, it's like this album's terrible. And let me spend the next hundred words telling you why. Yeah, and that yeah. is amazing. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, not too many people got got five mics. I mean, like off the top of my head, I know De La Soul. I know Tribe Called Quest. I know Nas got two. I think he got one for Illmatic and Stillmatic. Um, Jay has one uh, for the Blueprint, mm-hmm. but they wasn't giving out five mics a lot, and a lot of people were mad. I mean, people spent albums dissing the source <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because the last album that they put out didn't get five mics. Mm-hmm. I mean, Lil Wayne being one of them. <laughs> like, you know oh I mean? man, so this is the ge- this is the generational gap because I'm like, you are fine where they rated you, young man. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I agree, but I think now you know there are there are different you know there are different people who do album reviews now on mm-hmm. you know, like YouTube. Are there? Uh, where are those album reviews? What can they're I? They're unfortunately on places YouTube like YouTube. YouTube. Yeah, <laughs> um, but um, there's controversy around those as well but i don't know if they made the impact or make the impact currently that source magazine did like again the reason why people got so upset is because the source was an arbiter of truth (laughs) in hip-hop it was like if you got that five those five mics you were it like at that time nobody was especially not in hip-hop you know hip-hop music was kind of we were in a position where we weren't really checking for the Grammys. So we used other publications like stuff like, like the source as like, this is it for us. This is what matters in our music space. Um, so unfortunately, like I said, there were a lot of angry artists <laughs> with the source. Um, everybody knows, you know, or most people who listen to hip hop music remember when uh, Eminem and Benzino got into their back and forth beef and they were going on for like two years. How long did the Source Awards like last? Not, I feel like people might have taken their anger out on the fact that they got, they got low ratings at the Source Awards as well, but that could just be me. So. so the Source Awards, I think, went on for what, maybe five or six years? Yeah, it was very short lived. But I think what you guys are describing is a breakdown, uh, a break of the line between like media and art. So at one point in time, you, you, you sure, you could do whatever you wanted to do. But at some point, the, um, what's the word? Inmates took control of the asylum. <laughs> <laughs> because sure, you can in your song talk about what you don't like, but the fact that like now, again, I reiterate, artists are not interviewed. Artists are not, artists aren't interviewed. No one's really writing about them. They don't sit down for interviews. They just speak into their phone camera. And then like everybody who likes them, likes them. And like, they're not truly questioned in the same way. Um, And I think a lot of that comes from the era of people like Wale crawling up complex, um, (laughs) Lil Wayne doing this, the loss of PR people. I don't know where they went, Uh, but they're gone. Uh, This is where the journalists went. Um, So it's just a lot of, and even from a marketing perspective, that, People are mistaking sometimes what they think is journalism when it's simply just a marketing campaign. Yeah. It's not an article. It's a press release. That's not the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, that that's one hundred percent factual. Um yeah, especially especially now what you see uh, as we transition into this online space from print. Um, most of what you see from a lot of these publications are press releases. Um, yeah, a every, bummer. Every, you know, there, there's no in-depth um, dissection of, you know, like, to your point, asking the questions about not just like what you're doing, but why you're doing it, like going deep into the weeds of like why you make the music you make, how things were, you know, what exactly you were trying to portray in the music. It's it's 
it's very watered down. Um, Have you guys ever original. read uh, Dream Hampton's writings on any hip hop pieces, like her review of Reasonable Doubt or Dream Hampton's review of Omar? I want to say Reasonable Doubt, yes. That's probably Read it. Point. It is so smart. It's so intelligent. It's so interesting. Jay Z called her. He didn't know who she was. He did call her because he thought it was a guy. Um, and uh, even though she was tearing his album up, she, he thought he felt like she understood him. And then they became friends. But Torre, Dream Hampton, and like the writers that wrote, smart little boys and girls. But anyway, what else do we have here? <laughs> Let's not get sad about the fact that there is no more journalism. <laughs> Yes, for sure. So let's dive into TV and just like mm -hmm. what that space looked like over time. Um, and of course, we'll start with the BET network. Um, so BET was launched in 1980 by media entrepreneur Robert L. Johnson. There's a lot of Johnsons here. I have no relation. Um, <laughs> I mean, you could let us know. Like, <laughs> yeah, I would. I, yeah, I would definitely would have let you guys know. Did you guys all grow up with BET in your house? Yeah. Especially I, when it's in park. What a time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Time. Yeah. I mean, that that is closer to you know to Chantel's part 106 is a little bit closer to my to my era like when I was when I was when I was doing when I was watching BET in the 90s I was kind of just <laughs> staring up right like, it's funny because it's like you got Ed Gordon here but like the fact that you don't have Donnie Simpson yeah. is wild to me like that is BET and you don't have like like you got Tigger and I guess that's fine but y'all know that there were three hosts of Rap City before Tigger shows up. Yes. <laughs> so I I I try <laughs> to condense this because really if I if we really wanted to, we could probably do a webinar on BET itself. <laughs> Are y'all ready to go history retreat? The best. Love it. I don't know if y'all were like old enough to watch his from the street, but he is the original um punk. So punk was a show on BET on MTV, yeah, but it's from the street. That <laughs> Him and what's her name? L Lolita? The cartoon? No, that's that's different. That was when they were getting into the dot com era. Seriously. BET literally it was like, again, back to the marketing side, there was a TV show called BET.com. And there was a host, and her name was Tiffany. No, that's not it. Yeah, yeah. Um, yes. That was all in like the late 90s, um, right before we were going into 2000. BT.com and hits from the street and all of this really interesting programming. Um, and then I think it does culminate with 106 and Park as far as like competing with, what is that, TRL? Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. TRL, uh, MTV but and MTV Gems. And I will say that aside from the music, BT did a really good job with this with shows like programming, like they had a show called Teen Summit that yeah. really tried to like speak to the community <clears throat> of teenagers about issues. And it was really good. Ananda Lewis was the host. Mm -hmm. um, and I think she was a teenager at the time. So it was pretty cool. A lot of people who are like known people like Fassi Igby, the poet, was one of the panelists that used to be on there. And I would like watch on Saturday and we would, you know, listen to teenagers speak very earnestly about what was going on in their heart <laughs> as black people it was deep and it was uh, this is, Coca Cola as usual <laughs> so. this was another place where like hip-hop kind of like it it lived and breathed and it was it was it was different than it is now. Like when you went on Tigger to freestyle, like you had to, you had to come with something. <laughs> you, you couldn't just get up there and say anything. You know that. I mean, of I course, that, no, I'm kidding. There are some people, anything, but go ahead. <laughs> there, there are some people who did, but then there are like Ooh. there are classics. Um, I think everybody kind of remembers when when Dipset got on uh, got on. Uh, got on the basement and 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 Cam's freestyle. Jay went up there and did something crazy. State property had a crazy freestyle up there. It was a place where like rappers rapped onto uh, on on um 
Um, on Big Sister in the basement. Uh, and then I think uh, with 106 in Park, for for us, it was like after school. That was what you went home and watched, and then you know, yeah, every every day, yeah. every day. And then you had to you had to watch the freestyle battle. Like a lot of people got their start in music through going through those freestyle battles on 106 um, from people like Jin, and then of course uh, Shad Moss Bow Wow loves to tell us that he was Mister 106 um because of the amount of attention uh that his his music garnered through the platform so i think it was just used as like a huge marketing tool a lot of press runs went through 106 every time you were dropping a single or an album um you had to go and sit up there with aj aj and free and and have a discussion like it, it was just like a huge marketing platform for the music business um at that at that time a lot of great performances genuine yeah. performance that one stands out just a lot of great moments because i feel like a lot of it kind of helped bring everyone together right so like for me i would go home and like everybody from the block would come to my grandmother's house and especially the guys are coming over on freestyle friday <laughs> and you know we're talking about it we're like anticipating it like it was very much so like a show that we saw ourselves within um, because people would go to TRL, sure, but it wasn't anything. It was definitely more of like a more, I don't want to say what, <laughs> prim and proper kind of thing. Like it, I think TRL was a little bit more formal as opposed to uh, 106 and Park being something more of entertainment that you could see yourself with it. Yeah, and outside of the BET network, we have UPN. Now, my memories of UPN span back to like watching shows like Moesha with my siblings um, and my mom coming home from work and throwing on girlfriends almost every day. Uh, <laughs> um, and so like when UPN launched in the 1990s, um, it was a network that they, they pivoted away from the initial focus, which was on young white male viewers um and then they pivoted to a, a more centered around an african-american audience um and that was through uh tom newman or noonan who was appointed the executive v vp um and he is very well known for uh, green lighting uh shows from black writers and so when when i used to watch upn growing up i can just remember um particularly with Moesha, uh, like feeling like she was like so talented because my first experience with her was actually was music as opposed with Brandy was music as opposed to um, the, the show Moesha. And just like feeling like it was like it, it, she, she was extremely talented. But if you look at the cast in, in this photo, um, there's probably not a black actor that you see there that you haven't seen in something else. Um, these were people who like at the time a lot of these folks were getting their bearings in the industry um and some of these shows on upn were able to drive not just of course traffic to the network but they also used it as a marketing tool in between these shows we got advertisements for people's albums at a time when you would you know back when like places like target and best buy sometimes they would get like exclusives uh or they would have like exclusive content on people's albums and they would add you know we would get advertisements in between the shows um and of course you know people like sprite um would run ads during during these shows in between so like in terms in terms of the marketing like they they knew who the audience was that was watching these shows um and they made it you know it caused advertising uh, firms to make a pivot on how they approached um their their television ads so upn was was huge in, in at least in, in my experience but do you guys remember uh, <laughs> do you guys remember upn at all for sure i think for me while i'm hearing you talk it it's it goes to show how great of uh, how well these shows were produced because people still refer to them on across all of the the digital platforms now. So I think that um, 
the fact that we were able to see ourselves within um, Moesha, the Parkers. I think I probably shouldn't have been watching Girlfriends at the time that it came out, but you know, it is what it is. Um, for us to be able to go back and look at these shows now, or like at least see the clips and like be able to <laughs> refer and remember and like to actually be able to relate to these things now, I think that that is something that really goes to show how greatly produced these shows were. And it was just, wasn't just some black show that was on there. Yeah, I really yeah, I appreciate it. The, the way that the shows were feel, a lot of them were feel good TV, right? For black people too, like we could watch them and it wasn't struggle based and it wasn't, it was just funny and it was just like a good show and it was, real life things and they always you know there were always episodes where they brought in real life issues or topics or things that were going on and talked about them in a candid way or brought awareness to things but but i feel like a lot of them generally were were just shows that you could just watch and laugh with and just have fun with so that, that's what that was nice to have you know yeah to that point yeah the, co the connection is definitely still there i i often see uh people that are younger than me, you know, closer to Gen Z, like they are consistently posting memes from the Parkers, you know, screenshots of different scenes. And then uh, I remember one of the running trends on TikTok was, uh, you know, how Moesha used to, used to write in her diary. Um, <laughs> and and to, to see that become a trend, you know, in the 2020s, is really cool because it just it just shows how connected our experiences are through generations. And so then, of course, the, the WB Network, um, WB Network had some of my favorite shows. Uh, so it was launched as a joint venture between Warner Bros Entertainment and Tribune Broadcasting with the goal to reflect black culture while embracing the art of the music and the artists that embodied it. Um, so in 1995, it really started to pick up and become a hub for black ent entertainment in the 90s with shows like the Jamie Foxx show, um, Sister Sister, the Wayne's Bros. We got Steve, the Steve Harvey show here as well. Um, and on the Jamie Foxx show, his job is marketing. He writes jingles, <laughs> um, sings them. And so uh, when, when, when I was growing up, I can remember the Wayne's Bros, particularly being one of my favorite shows to watch. Um, and just, uh, of course, like from, you know, experiencing like the Wayne's Bros, like comedy from like stuff like In Living Color and stuff like that. Um, jumping into Wayne's Bros was seamless for me. It kind of like made me, uh, it made me think about my relationship with my brother. Um, and how we would interact with each other um so yeah that, that was one of our favorite shows growing up i know every time we would come home from school and just throw it on you know wb uh and steve harvey show was hilarious so <laughs> um it has some heavy hitters that obviously you know people know you know steve harvey people people know what his what his body of work is as well as cedric cedric the entertainer it just, they just did a really good job of grabbing folks that were of course, you know, that we had, we, you know, the black community already had a connection to through things like, you know, Def Jam comedy, comedy and stuff like that. But they, they worked with um, black writers to, in, to try to ensure that the actual content that they were putting out was authentic as opposed to just grabbing a bunch of black people and putting out a show, um, which I can appreciate. Uh, so so can, you, can you guys speak to anything that you remember about WB? I remember these shows, but I think one thing to note, I, I think that all of these shows really pulled from the artist's strength, or like the actor's strength, right? Yes. The Wayne Brothers, they're hilarious. Jamie Foxx, hilarious, but he also sings. And I feel like every chance they got, they were able to like really pull in those strengths um, from those actors and um, play into it. So um, I remember watching every single one of these shows. And I think, um, I'm not sure as far as like the first two, like the Wayne's Brothers and Steve Harvey show, like if that's 
on any streaming platform, but I've seen clips from the Jamie Foxx show and like other shows that we've watched, you know, in the 90s and early 2000s. And just to go back and like be able to watch them and even some of the topics that they have still ring true, it's very interesting to like, um, to, to revisit, so yeah. Yeah, I think Jamie Foxx show is my favorite for sure. But uh, I think that a lot of these are, or some of them are still like running on reruns. I think like MTV has the Wayans Brothers and Jamie Foxx show and like My Wife and Kids and like some of the other shows still playing. So it's good to see some of those too. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think when you look at the landscape of television right now, um, as opposed to where it was at at this time in the 90s, and a lot of these networks, um, part of the reason why they were positioning themselves this way is because of Fox. Um, Fox had, Fox started to, they started to take over. They had Living Single, they had Martin, um, and there, there was kind of a fight for the Black community's attention at that time. And when you look at the landscape of television right now, you know, the, the Black sitcom, um, it's still a thing. I don't know if they hit the way that they used to hit, <laughs> um, but it, it is, to your point, Vital, it's always refreshing for me to go back and just like watch an episode here and there um, and have some of that nostalgia. And on that point of WB, um, I just had to throw this in there because I don't know if anybody remembers it. Every time I bring it up, nobody know, remember. Nobody remembers Wayne Head, and I don't understand I know. how. Yeah, I, know. I, I like know. that. Um, <laughs> Wayne Wayne Head, the Wayne brothers put this together, and Wayne Head had like one season. But I can remember. I can remember um, thinking it was so so cool um, to just have like a normal black cartoon character walking around doing normal black kid stuff um so wayne had for me like i remember me and my brother used to sing, sing the theme song together and stuff <laughs> while we were sitting in the living room uh watching it and then static shock superhero static shock was like at least my first experience uh one of my first experiences between him and green Lantern. those are my first experiences seeing black superheroes at all um on the television um, so these, these were cartoons with, with black voice actors, um, and black main characters. And during that time, you know, on, you know, whether it's Saturday morning car cartoons or whatever, they were of course advertising to all of the black kids, um, in our communities through, you know, of course, video games, we always had an N64 commercial coming on or, um, or other other things like um, like like movies would run their ads every sat you know every Saturday morning, and WB had it. So like when I was watching through WB cartoons, these were definitely two that I picked out because they had characters that looked like me. Yeah, Static Shock was the one. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> one of one of my favorite favorite cartoons sure. ever. Um, I'd love to jump into radio. Uh, really quickly and just talk about, so w, WLAC in Nashville really kind of jump-started Black music on, on radio. It was a, you know, it was long, it was pioneered radio station in uh, the United States, played a key role in developing and development of R&B and soul music um, in the 1950s and 60s. The station uh, basically at nighttime would play Black music um, which was largely uh, ignored on mainstream radio at the time. And so they pretty much are some of the reasons, you know, especially in early on in their career that we have people like Little Richard, James Brown, Ray Charles reaching the masses. Um, so WLAC Nashville to me is, is, was crucial in black artists and black music getting on radio and being spread throughout the United States um, at the time, especially if you know how important Nashville is to music and the music industry at large. I know that like right now, everybody is like Atlanta and this and that, but Nashville consistently um, throughout music history is a place that like, if you can, if you get known in Nashville and, and you can break into the music in, in Nashville, you can 
pretty much break in anywhere if you if you're known there. And so to have those major major uh, artists in black music to know that they got like some of the some of them got their first start through these platforms to me is huge. And then another one from early on is Word Atlanta. So Atlanta's Word AM was um, it was purchased in 1949 by J.B. Blayton, um, who became the first African American in the country to own a radio station. Um, this is cool. And, yeah, it, 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 it's it's incredible. Um, and so by 1951, Word had become Atlanta's leading Black appeal station, and the jockey Jack Gibson was Atlanta's favorite DJ. Um, they mm -hmm. were popped out as a Black-owned radio station, um, mm -hmm. which in 1951 is an incredible feat. Um, and Jack Gibson, I believe they pulled from Chicago. He was on ch Chicago radio before they brought mm -hmm. him to Atlanta um, to work at Word Atlanta. And then we've got WDI Memphis. So WDI Mem DIA Memphis, uh, was the first radio station in the United States to have an all black on air staff, um, making it a groundbreaking institution in, in Memphis as well as nationwide. But of course, many notable acts came through, uh, came, came through there and got their some of their first exposure there, BB King being one of them. Um, Bobby Blue Bland, they were very well known for uh, the, the blues music that they would play on this station. I have a question. Absolutely. Were you able, when you were doing your research, to find out how these guys went about um, sourcing ads and like who ran ads on the stations? Yeah. So the so in, in, in these for for these three particular stations, um, unfortunately, <laughs> one of one of the large contributors to ads on these radio stations was actually cigarette companies. Um, I mean, it is what it is. They have the money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, a lot. Like we've seen the movies. People smoked a lot. But, so. Yeah. Cigarette companies were, were, and I mean, you know, we talked about it with Jet Magazine. You saw that ad. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, but cigarette companies, the, <laughs> the, the marketing campaigns that they ran at that time through the 30s, 40s, and 50s, um, they, to your point, they had the money. Um, mm -hmm. And they, they they ran campaigns heavily um, through radio because at the time, um, you know, we're talking about radio now, but before before television, radio was the hub. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, for, for, sure. for communication as well. Uh, you know, radio and print were the communication mm -hmm. uh, channels. So, with uh, with with <laughs> with with cigarettes being, you know, of course, be at the at the time, you could still smoke indoors you know, <laughs> you know there, there was there were a lot of things that they that they um that they allowed at the time that aren't allowed now <laughs> so so and it was a part of the culture too what's interesting right it was just culturally ubiquitous yeah. like it was what was done and it's interesting that a cigarette company whether they wanted you to work in the back office maybe not but they wanted to sell you their item and they yeah. would buy it by ad time <laughs> on these stations and then someone had to read. So I wonder, I'm curious who was doing like the ad reads and, and all of that stuff. It's very interesting to find out like, was it being supported by the community? So was it like a lot of local businesses like come to Chantel's Soul Kitchen and mm -hmm. you know, at one, two, three, four Main Street. Cause those ads, like that's money, but yeah. like I'm really curious like what type of ecosystem was being created by having these like small black owned radio stations that probably were listened to mostly by black people like i'm curious aside from like the cigarette ads but like and the liquor ads but like what type of like local stuff like yeah, you know? i know um with nashville uh mm -hmm. i know uh auto sales were big too there you go um, so yeah that's that that was popular even on wbls like as i was a kid yeah um, <laughs> i don't know y'all are way too young y'all don't know who dick gidron is but in New York, there is a man named Dick Gidron who had a Cadillac. It might have been a Ford dealership. And I remember on WBLS, even as a kid, you always hear Dick Gidron Cadillac. I wonder how his family is doing. I'm going to Google them. <laughs> but I'm sure they're very wealthy or not. It's either one or the other. But I'm curious, like it was probably like local car dealerships and stuff like that. Like that ecosystem that you get to create when you do have 
a space like a radio station is pretty nifty. Yeah. I'm going to Google the Dick Gidron family now. I need to know what they're up to. <laughs> Got to know. And so as we, you know, you know, as oh, we, look. <laughs> WBLS. No, WBLS. As we, yeah. As we headed towards the modern age, um, we got WBLS, and um, this was a, a, a transition. WBLS before um, it was what many of us knew it in the Black community. Um, right before they were uh, they were pushing jazz music for a good number of years, and before that, it was a variety of uh, different um, different types of music. And when WBLS launched, they actually did like as we entered into the late seventies, early uh, you know eighties and nineties, um, they actually did they did have hip hop and rap on WBLS. Um, and one of the controversial things that that transpired <laughs> transpired um, was there was a, a push by. Um, I believe it was I believe it was a religious organization in New York or a church in New York um, that was pushing for boycotting um, if they did not remove gangster rap from. Yeah, but you gotta go all the way back. Yeah, <laughs> they did not want to play it. They were not going. Yeah. to play it. it was a respectable place, very yeah. respectful black folks, and this was not respectable music even before you got into language. Absolutely. The idea was like youth culture, and this is like a very adult. Mm -hmm. Station. This yeah. is adults, and Frankie so Crawford wanted yeah. nothing to do with hip hop music, rap music, or whatever we were calling it. They were calling it because I was I wasn't even born, and they didn't <laughs> want nothing to do with it. It takes a long time yeah. for them to even be involved, and then they do, and it's good for them. Mm. And then your thing about the religious people come and circle back about gangster yep. rap. That's whatever that. <laughs> Um, because the early rap music was not gangster rap. It was just songs mm. about going to parties and getting drunk. <laughs> Who doesn't love that? Yeah, I, I, I was, when I was, you know, when I was reading up on, on WBLS, I was confused as to what gangster rap they were talking about. Cause... They were talking about <laughs> the NWAs of okay. it all, which is okay. a lot for the ears. Yeah, at that time, it, you know, it was a lot for my ears. Like I literally was there, and I was like, <laughs> yeah. no, 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 no. "This is now. This is let me. I, I got to turn this off." Um, so that type of music, they were like, "We don't want this." Um, they only have three black stations in New York, well, two. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but WBLS did, you know, in that right, they laid the the groundwork for. Um, at least modern black radio. Without WBLS, I don't know if we're even able. Like you, sometimes you got to ease your way in to these markets. Really, really consuming um, black black culture and black music. Um, Can we talk about WLIB really quickly? Because WLIB is like the Jet Magazine of like black radio, and it's like, still around too. Like, yeah. Like, they always made the funds, but they're they're definitely around and a <laughs> lot of pertinent information about the community mm -hmm. that's not mainstream is definitely on yes. WLIB. So um, yeah. So like I don't know if y'all know there's a there's a thing called the week used to be a show called The Week in Review. Mm. Where they would talk about black issues from yeah. and it would be New York based and then outward. And like so I grew up listening. I had very black parents. Um so like we watch like it is. We listen to the weekend mm -hmm. review. Even as an adult, long after my parent, my mom was passed, and like my dad was like living not even in New York. I when I used to have a car, I would listen to the weekend review just to like be up on like what was going on um, locally, and then like how that impacted nationally. Um, and I know that that some of the people have passed away, unfortunately, yeah. as it were, but they still do it. It's still really useful, and that kind of community stuff is like. WLIB and then like having people who write for the Amsterdam News be there mm -hmm. and like all of these tie-ins and they had ads too, even though, you know, it's news people like there's like this interest in it. And I think that's the people who own WBLF slash WLIB's greatest gift to the community is their ability to do public affairs 
at a high level for years and years and years and across like different generations. I mean, and we still do it. I mean, because I, I don't listen to the radio that often on the weekends, but um, they still have, I forgot what his name is, um, that still comes up for uh, the Amsterdam news and, and speaks to like what's going on. And then you have, um, oh my gosh, I can't remember his name, that does like the Caribbean uh, version of Robert it. Levy. Yes. Well, David Levy used to be like, I learned about, because my family's American, and mm -hmm. I learned about, well, I knew about dance hall, but I learned about more broad Caribbean music from listening to David Levy's like um, live streams. Yeah. Like, you grew up with him. Like, you know how people have like um, Flex in Brooklyn, or like Pasa Pasa for like younger people? <laughs> for like my group, it's like David Levy um, and then like the reggae hour. Like, those are like the two things that we grew mm -hmm. up with before y'all had y'all stuff on B-Cat and stuff like that. It's and, so, and like Gary Bird too, he's still around. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 <sighs> what a time. <laughs> yeah, so now we get into, of course, Hot 97. <laughs> Hot 97 <laughs> for me, Hot 97 for me is probably like why I listen to rap music, um, <laughs> period. Like I I don't I don't know if um there was anything more pivotal to my experience with uh hip hop and art R and B than Hot 97. I can remember being extremely young and staying up with my older brother because he had like a radio that he had gotten for Christmas, and I can remember recording when people would come up to flex to to freestyle. We would record over the cassette tapes just so that we had like Jay's freestyles and state property freestyles and 18 freestyles. Like <laughs> we were, we were like heavily into this stuff. Um, and it was just, it was so important. And these were people that like for me, flex was also like kind of accessible. Like I remember the first time that I like went to Stu Leonard's, I don't know if people remember Stu Leonard's, but <laughs> I went to Stu wow. Leonard's with, with my mom and saw Funk Flex just like shopping for groceries there. And I was like, what is going on? Funk Flex is here, <laughs> like losing my mind. Uh, <laughs> and so um, the, these, particularly when you look at like in, in New York City, Hot 97, you know, in terms of like adding more R&B and hip hop to their playlist at that, at that time, when they transitioned into this moment for Hot 97, um, where they were playing, where they were pretty much, again, pushing the black music scene. Um, it, it was, it was huge. I think every kid that grew up, uh, in, in New York at that time remembers both Flex and Andy Martinez. Those are two, two people that still have a ton of success in music today. Um, Angie has moved on to like more interviews and podcasts with, you know, in a range of pop culture, um, but Hot 97, and then when you think about like in terms of marketing, you know, to the point that we were talking about with uh, with some of the, the earlier publications in print, uh, Hot 97 it was, I guess, the, the poster child at, at that time, at least in hip hop and R&B music for things like you know, payola and controversy. There was a lot of a lot of conversation around like, oh, Rockefeller is paying for their records to be played. They have they have a relationship with Funk Flex, and like you know, they don't you know they only play a specific type of rap music because of um, different relationships. But again, at at that time, there there was probably no genre of music that payola did not exist in. Um, every record label was paying to get their records onto radio and and spin their records and Hot 97 was was ne not ne it was no different um the 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 marketing that I experienced to your point Chantel there was a lot of <laughs> there was a lot of uh, there was a lot of auto ads on on Hot 97 but there was also a lot of um the, of course there was a lot of marketing for music there were a lot of press runs that r ran through there for folks that were releasing albums folks, folks that were releasing books, black writers, it just became a hub for, for black culture in general. Um, and, 
you know, you guys talked about um, Essence and we can't talk about Hot 97 without talking about Summer Jam and how huge that was. That, that I mean, and, and still to, 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 to this point, it's still big, not as big as it once was, but before before there was a rolling loud like going to summer jam was it there, there there was no like that was for the youth um it was it was huge so hot 97 to me is it, especially in mo the modern era of hip hop is probably one of the larger uh <laughs> one of the large larger places and uh radio definitely radio stations and it definitely deserves its credit Um, I think it's really funny that we talk about Hot 97 like this. I think a Kiss FM more like that, but to Hot 97 credit, oh yeah. Um, it used to be a freestyle station. Yeah. Y'all know what freestyle is? Yeah. I forgot about that, but yeah, you're right. <laughs> it was, it was a, it was down the dial when they mm -hmm. moved, it changed, but so it's all youth. Sometimes it's youth culture, not black culture. Do you know what I mean? So freestyle yeah. and hip hop and house music could exist in similar spaces because if you were a New York City kid who went to high school in the early 90s, you have a familiarity with freestyle and house music and hip hop. But when Hot 97 moves down the dial and now it's just like all, it's like, what is it? Yeah, where, yeah, where hip hop lives, it's right there in front of me. That's mm -hmm. the tagline. Um, and sure it was, they played a little bit of R&B, but it was R&B like with like a hip hop feel at that time. Um, interesting though. It's very interesting to listen to y'all talk about like Summer Jam because I went to the first Summer Jam and the tickets were nineteen dollars and <laughs> it was so fun. It was really like so good. Um, I don't even know how we got. I don't think I drove. Funny story. The Wu Tang performed there and then we met them after the show. That's how random it was. It was like, again, the inmates running the asylum in a way because everyone was kids. <laughs> so it's very different energy. It was, it was just energy, just like energy. It was a really good time, $19.97. Sure. That was That's the hook. <laughs> <laughs> it was, was 1994, yeah. though. That was almost 30 years ago. Yeah. But it was, it was the first time, so you have to get people in. I can tell you my first time, and I can also tell you the last time I went to Summer Jam. We don't need to talk about that here. Um, <laughs> I'm going to that offline. But I haven't been to a summer jam in a very long time. That's not for me. Um, yeah, but there was always like the summer jam, the Funk Master Flex car stuff. Like he leveraged that. There was always these tie-ins with like Black Expo. Yes. There was tie-ins with like the Puerto Rican Day Parade. Mm -hmm. um, so there was all these like ethnic tie-ins. There was tie-ins with like Caribbean Parade. Like there was all of this stuff to kind of like tie into the community that they identified. And then there would be like, not quite freestyle nights, but I guess like freestyle nights where maybe they would do like have a party that they would like. That, that was the other thing. A lot of parties would be advertised on the radio. Like, oh, Angie Martinez is hosting here. Funk Quest is DJing here. You know, Cypher Sounds is here. This one, everyone's Wendy Williams is here. Everyone is, you know, cross branding and getting yeah. involved. And now everybody's got nights at clubs and it mm. just kind of creates like these circles. And then like Flex and his car show. Um, I don't think Angie really had anything because at that time she was real into like the radio of it all. Yeah. But Wendy Williams was always doing like external things, like long before the TV show. She was so amazing um, in her work, and she would always be doing stuff. They they made a lot of money, and they definitely established themselves um, for a long time. And the thing about Paola, you guys, just to be fair. Not to be like the I was a journalism major, but it, it doesn't. It's not. It's just always existed. Yes, it has yes. always existed. That someone, especially it still you know, records. I was just about to say that. Yeah, for sure. You can hear it in the music. So, yeah. Yes, but it's always existed. So you could always hear it in the music. It's. It's. I think it might. There might be like constitutional law about payola. There is. So it's not. You know what I mean. So there's always been someone with a record asking someone to play it, offering them money. So it's always, there's never been like, it's not this pureness that we like to think like from before. It's just maybe they're faster or sneakier, but if they get caught, they're gonna go to jail. <laughs> like if somebody wants to make a problem, they can get in trouble and they can go to jail. It's like against the law. <laughs> but 
like totally like not allowed. You're not supposed to pay people to play stuff on the radio. Yeah, the the so, modern version of that is is the playlisting and paying, mm -hmm. paying for that. And again, Spotify has been fairly outside of the <laughs> outside of the official Spotify playlist. When others, you know, who create these playlists try to take payment. Um, Spotify is, has, is pretty good about sniping their accounts, removing them, removing their playlists. Mm -hmm. um, I won't really get into like whether or not Spotify is taking money, but <laughs> I do have a question for y'all from like a marketing perspective. What do you guys think the music video is as it ties to marketing? Now? Like the period, period from the first mm -hmm. minute to now, like the music video, because if there's a video. Do you want to hear it more on the radio? Because you can only watch a video once unless you got the box or, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. I think um, at, at one point, I think the music video was, I, I, of course, no matter what, like throughout all of history, I think that there are music videos that were shot in an effort just to like as a as a basically as a as an ad for the music mm -hmm. so there were music videos where there were just like you know there was partying there was of course liquor bottles in and out of you know yeah there's I'm product placement in it uh, like before the product placement videos because that's more yeah. marketing <laughs> yes. also, everybody wants to talk about payola and not to get all spicy but some of our favorite rappers also do name check products in their music. And sometimes it's free, but I think one day someone woke up and was like, you know, if we say Crystal, well, not Crystal, because we know what happened with them, but like perhaps <laughs> Motorola phones, like a flip phone. Yeah. The first time you name check it, but sometimes I think that, I think the marketing is in the music <laughs> it is. More than just the it is. I, I mean, and I think it goes beyond just the guys and, you know, the folks who actually, you know, own brands because Jay is, you know, Jay-Z is going to talk about his brands because he owns them and like he's going to market them every time he raps. But he yeah, but, uh, he's he's before too. Brands he didn't own for the longest. Exactly. <laughs> um, and, and that's kind of the thing. All of them were doing it before. Um, to your point, there was the there was the, the era between uh the 90s into the 2000s where every rapper had a motorola two-way pager inside of their videos um and, and the, inside the of their rap yep. so not just in their videos in their raps yep and even a song I think that's what I yeah. so <laughs> i wonder what the contracts look like for that we talk a lot about payola but i wonder what else is like you know can we give it a lot of swing both ways. Like, yeah everything is marketing <laughs> that's that's yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's my feeling on it. Everything is marketing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Power 105, another heavy hitter in uh I guess the hip hop and R and B space, especially in uh New York, um, which was launched in two thousand two. Uh one oh five one changed to a mainstream urban format uh to take to try to take enough rate ratings from its rival Hot 97. Um, so that was when they really pivoted um, into heavily pushing urban music on the radio station. Um, Power 105 won for me. Um, I don't know that I went to Power 105 for music, um, but I, I definitely know that when I, uh, I definitely know that when The Breakfast Club initially launched, I was always listening to it. I would listen to it on my way to school, um, whether that was in my own headphones or like, you know, my mom has it playing in the car. And I think the the, the Breakfast pl Club um, on top of the music, you know, as we can see, like now the Breakfast Club, they still like they still put out content through, you know, uh, through online mediums with uh, videos and they're still um, they're still heavily involved in, in the cut in the culture. But I think Power 105 one was it was so interesting because like I said, I for me, I didn't actually go to Power 105 one for music. I like that was probably like my first experience, like really wanting to sit down and listen to people just talk on the radio. Cause any other time that my parents would have that on, 
what, while we were driving on a long trip or something like that, I'd usually just tune it out and put my headphones in and listen to music. <laughs> um, so that was like my first experience really wanting to listen to people just sit there and talk on radio. And um, so I, I always like have fond memories of Power 105. They've had some more recent interviews in, in history that I haven't really been interested in. I don't 100% listen to them any longer. Um, but at the time, um, especially in like 2010, around that time, I was listening to The Breakfast Club probably every day. I think I listen to Power 105 a little bit now more than I drive than before. I think for mm -hmm. me, I was growing up listening to a lot of like WBLS, so like the Doug Banks morning show, a lot of like WLIP. Um, I would say, you know, talk radio because I, I didn't really have that luxury of not listening to what my parents were listening to. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> so I think that um, I feel like, of course, them being syndicated, you know, kind of helped them reach across the nation. But I think um it was just something new it was something fresh hot 97 was just playing the same thing over and over again we were just used to just the same thing so i think a lot of people moved to power 105 or at least wanted to hear what they had to say because it was just something fresh and new and um you know but now i'll tell you what i did hmm? i i well one i started to get probably started getting into like starting to curate my own stuff mm. you know like with your ipod and you're, you know, making your mixed CDs. And the only person who I wanted to hear talk on the radio was Wendy Williams. Yeah, and she was on um, 107.5. Right, and so when Charlemagne left and joined this, I was like, it's, first of all, I don't like DJ Envy. <laughs> I can understand that. <laughs> you can clip that if you want. Um, it's live. <laughs> great. No, so we're definitely clipping that for social. <laughs> oh, man. Um, I mean, I have more to say. I'll stop there. Yeah, um, but <laughs> but uh, Wendy Williams is where it ends for me as far as like radio personalities. Mm -hmm. There is nobody better. Because what you guys don't like, she had beef with the same people who will come to her show. That is amazing. And sit them. The sit artists, right nowadays, yeah. artists nowadays do not are not built to accept what they had to deal with in mm -hmm. front of Wendy in order to get that those ears. Yeah, I think even radio Wendy is completely different from TV Wendy. Already, I don't yeah. I don't know who TV Wendy is because I don't watch <laughs> that show. But radio Wendy, a queen. There is nobody better. Like that, what she did, is no one better. She would talk about people, people would argue with her, and then they would still find themselves sitting in the studio talking to her. <laughs> and even like, as far as marketing, she, because her content was so good and I feel like she, you know, she's a little rough sometimes, but she's trending on, on TikTok. All the time, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, I mean, it just time. goes to show that if you have something good, you can, the longevity is definitely there. And yeah. she's not even, yeah. you know, Hopefully she's out there living life to the fullest. And no, I mean she's getting well. Yeah. Good. So that's all we hope. I just want her to have a podcast. Conquer one last thing, Wendy. You need a podcast, <laughs> and then she'll have caught all of the rings. If Wendy Williams can get well and be and have a podcast every week, she would have literally conquered everything. Mm. Yeah, she's I think um, to that to that point, there's a lot of people. Um, not not just with Wendy, but I think she's definitely one of one of the top people that comes to mind. There's a lot of people that in the podcasting game who have tried to take her wave, her wave and run with it, but it it doesn't it doesn't hit. Um, which is not surprising to me, but <laughs> but it's it's funny yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. those two two stations because being from the south, I think I don't think those two stations came into play for me till much later on when I was able to see them on YouTube. Mm. The stuff for us was Greg Street, Frank Ski. Oh, yeah. I know who he uh -huh. is. Yeah, like, Greg, you know, Street. like Greg Street be banging like on 103. Like that was that was the guy. 
Um, especially for my generation, like I actually went to my one of my best friends, his dad well, I was on the founder of Showing Up Records and him and Greg Shoot are like best friends. And Greg Shoot was always tied into the community and giving back. He would invite like the high school kids up there. We would like if we whoever won the the championship in basketball, football, got to go on his show. Um, and then like Frank Ski had like the parties, like you mentioned, the Shia was big when when I was a little kid. I remember that being a thing. And yeah, like so it was, it's same, same stuff, but yeah, you know, different different stations, different people. Yeah. That was during an, an era where regionalism was like still a thing. And like, yeah. uh, we didn't necessarily have to hear from every artist from everywhere. Like you kind of had to, like, you had to know somebody at that yeah. time <laughs> who was like <laughs> into whatever the market was like in the South or out West, yeah. especially once you get out of like, you know, once you step out of people's like mainstream music. Um, I want to talk a little bit about people who were you know, people who were pioneers um, for black marketing and black advertising. Um, so I just want to go through these uh, these slides really quick and give some folks their fat, their flowers. Um, so we, of course, got Tom Burrell. Tom Burrell was the first black man advertiser in Chicago and is known for implementing black culture into his marketing campaigns for brands like McDonald's and Coca-Cola. Um, Burrell's creativity and positive portrayal of black people made him a pioneer and true targeted marketing um, and he now of course he owns his own firm Burrell Communications that works with a variety of brands but Tom Burrell at, at, at that time was huge I mean he's still huge now um, but his his campaigns were extremely extremely pivotal especially when you think about um, I think the other day uh, myself and Chantel were discussing uh, Coca-Cola and how they kind of, especially in, uh, especially in the drink space and the soft drink space, they started to push um, different advertisements with black people in them. And Tom Burrell was somebody who spearheaded a lot of those campaigns um, that we saw. So Tom Burrell is definitely one of the pioneers within, uh, within the marketing space, especially for black marketers. Another person that we have here is Carol H. Williams. So Carol H. Williams, um, for those who don't know, she created the iconic tagline for secret deodorant, strong enough for a man, but made for a woman. Um, and she is also the mastermind behind the Pillsbury Doughboy G Giggle, which most people definitely don't know about that yeah. one. And um, anybody who, like for me, I can remember um, seeing Pillsbury commercials and like once we got into the store, it was like, oh, the buy one, get one free, mom. <laughs> can we can we get them? So like uh, obviously it worked because <laughs> I, I left my house and um, I wanted my mom to bring home the Pillsbury cookies so we could like go into the kitchen and, and, and bake together. Um, so she currently uh, she currently owns her own. She, she owns the largest black owned ad, ad agency um in the country but again carol h williams was pivotal in in marketing i think a lot of her uh, a lot of her ideas and campaigns you can still see the effects of them and the influence of them to this day then we have harry weber um so harry weber was uh, the first art director at motown and he also created the famous band-aid stuck on me ad campaign so for all of you who remember those ads as a kid where you know I, i'm stuck on band-aid band-aid you know that that whole jingle mm -hmm. tim um he's also known for helping to create the iconic slogan slogan by the united negro college fund a mind is a terrible thing to waste um and so again <laughs> like the these people have contributed things that to this day, you will still go to, you know, a, a graduation speech. You'll go, you'll go, you'll, go, you'll, you'll listen to a podcast, and you will hear these phrases, um, and you'll not, you won't understand or know where they come from. And these are black marketers that are creating all of this, and um, his his work on on that campaign, as well as the quality has, is quality is job one campaign for Ford. Um, helped him earn a spot in the Clio Hall of Fame as a marketer. 
huge accomplishments for um, for people at that time. And then last but certainly not least, we have Carolyn Jones. Carolyn Jones was the first black uh, copywriter hired by J. Walter Thompson in the 1960s. And her agency created KFC's We Do Chicken Right tagline. Um, and so Jones, her approach to, mar uh, to marketing emphasized selling through emotions, which now, as you can see through um, almost any resource that you go to, for marketing will tell you how important it is to make emotional connections with your customers um, through their journey. And she is one of the people who first was first to figure out that people want to feel things more than they just want to be sold to. Mm -hmm. And so let's talk about black culture and marketing today. Let's. <laughs> so We'll start with black music, uh, just like a short synopsis. We know how popular, you know, hip hop has become. We know how popular black music has become. We saw Rihanna, of course, take the stage at this year's halftime show. We've had many black acts uh, before then. Last year, we had like the collection of like the West Coast with Snoop Dogg and Dr. Dre and um, Kendrick Lamar got up there. Um, but this year, Rihanna's Super Bowl halftime show actually brought in more viewers than the game itself. Um, so this is what, when we talk about influence, this is what we mean. Um, because people literally like hopped on to, like ran to their television to watch this woman perform and then just turned it off. And we're like, <laughs> <"I'm good." laughs> I've seen what I needed to see. Um, and I'm sure there are people who maybe stuck around there. There are also people who watched the game in the beginning to get to the halftime show and then turned it off. Mm -hmm. But when we talk about, you know, influence and how influential black culture actually is, especially today, um, you can look no further. And this is not really a slight to the black um, performers who came before Rihanna. It's just that now we're in a space where black music is so influential that you can't ignore it. Um, and so it to, to me, when I saw those numbers, I, I was a little bit taken aback. Um, but again, it's kind of surprising, but not really. <laughs> um, when you actually think about the numbers that Rihanna does and how influential she currently is, especially yeah. among the youth. Um, there's no real surprise surprises there. And then when we also talk about, you know, black musicians, you know, entrepreneur and musician Pussy T famously created the uh the I'm loving it campaign and for McDonald's. Um he was paid five hundred K. That jingle is worth a lot more than five hundred K. Um but yet and still um he made his money you know, or made some money on the back end through owning uh, Arby's, the We Got the Meats, that's also mm -hmm. Pussy yeah. um, And there are, you know, countless other examples when you look at Black music, how Black music has become the soundtrack to popular social channels um, for sponsored posts, for trends, for content from brands and influencers in their marketing campaigns. Um, it kind of, you know, as, as as hip hop and um, and and R and B grow in popul popularity amongst the youth, and as the as that youth ages up, it only makes sense that the brands and the advertisers want to get in front of them and they want to try to relate to them, um, and they a lot of them do that through the music within their ads. Um, and so it's not really surprising to me that folks like Meg Thee Stallion and Doja Cat and um, all these different artists on TikTok are dominating because their music speaks to the culture of, of the youth on those platforms. Um, Batal, did you want to jump in and just talk about black athletes and how like they're used in, in ad campaigns? Yeah, absolutely. I think that um, sports is something that's been big in my life forever, right? And I think that we look at how black athletes have transcended being 
just athletes or spokespersons, but spokespeople for brands, like really being their own brands, right? Like you look at the impact somebody recently like Steph Curry has had on basketball and boosting Under Armour. And you look at Colin Kaepernick being out of the NFL and taking a stand for civil rights and justice and inequality and it and it landing him or landing Nike huge, huge boost in revenue and things like that from things he's not even doing on the field, right? Um, and then another athlete I think that is not on here, but one that impacted me is Tiger Woods, right? Like I grew up and I started playing golf. And when you, I played golf with nothing but other young black kids in the inner city golf course, like Tiger Woods was, there was no other person that we looked up to at the time, right? Then we learned our history about a lot of others that paved the way for him. But I mean, I think that for a second, right? Like it, it drove a ton of people in our community to the golf course and picking up a, a new sport, right? Because of the things that he was doing and the way he did them and his dominance. And same with, you know, you see, you see a lot of black women that are athletes, you know, really driving culture amongst women and, and, and young girls and getting them into sports and, and then, you know, pay equity and bringing those conversations into the sports and a lot of other things as well. And it's, it's such a driver of change and culture and on and off the field. And, you know, you, you look at sports as something that really can bring people together as well, especially within this country. So. Yeah. I think it speaks to how dominant some of the, like when you look at Serena, Serena is one of the most dominant athletes ever, if not Absolutely. the most dominant athlete ever. Um, and when you're really good at what you do and uh p and you know of course like you know within our culture people look up to you of course people are going to flock for things like endorsements and to use you in marketing campaigns um and you just look at the list I, obviously we've got folks at folks in here and like even even somebody like colin kaepernick like people try to act like he wasn't a, a good nfl quarterback but the reality is that all of these people are like representations of black excellence um, and excellence, excellence sells. People want to, people strive, you know, especially when you look at Nike's, their entire brand messaging is around excellence and being the best and being able to persevere through obstacles, which as we know, like people like Serena, as well as Colin Kaepernick have had to do that. Um, but even things like um, like Jordan Brand and and the and the endorsements that he began to get um, in the '90s and the you know I want to be like Mike campaign um, and Muhammad Ali and Simone Biles like is that Muhammad Ali with cigarettes too? That he that is cologne actually. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a that's yeah. a cologne ad. Um, from from Ali, but um, it it just speaks to like again across, especially in these athletic fields, um, how how dominant some of these athletes really are, and how important they are to their individual sports, which is what leads, of course, like the Gatorades and the Kellogg's and the Nikes and Adidas and and Under Armour, like that's what really drives them towards like we don't have a choice. Like we have to give Jordan a billion dollars because look at where the youth sat. Now, again, the, maybe the marketing of Michael Jordan is what caught is currently causing uh, the sneaker market to look like what it is today. <laughs> I think it's probably lack of creativity and the ability. Yeah, to I think, I think so too. Um, not Michael Jordan, he's just- But, oh no, I'm just speaking from, from the standpoint of the reseller market in sneakers i think at one point i remember when you could walk into the store and actually just buy a pair of jordans like and the fact that you have to have a bot to order a pair of sneakers offline <laughs> right now is crazy but that, that is what happens when um when you have like a polarizing figure like mike who again he has now transcended generations he's he's been out of basketball since 2000, <laughs> 2000 and something, and and still um, one of the highest selling sneakers. Um, he his his brand obviously is huge. You have athlete, you have mergers between athletic brands and music, 
where um, people like uh, people people like uh, Drake, for example, partnering with Jordan Brand and putting out you know lines of sneakers. It's 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 so interesting to see how far these different brands have have come. But but of course, again, when you look at all of these industries, whether it's the NBA or or Nike or the NFL, um, these are multi billion dollar industries. And so um, again, when it comes when it comes to marketing, they want to market their best, and these are the best. <laughs> So when it comes to black fashion and aesthetics uh, in marketing today, um, we have designers like Virgil Abloh who have helped to bridge uh, the gap between streetwear and luxury designs in the modern era. Um, we also have people like Telfair Clement Clemens, um, who I know like when when uh, when the bags drop, I know my sister is like there like she <laughs> like glued to the the, the computer re ready to make a purchase um and his designs have blown up especially among among black women um as well as folks like dapper dan um who of course you know as a harlem based couture uh he you know he's he's famous for his customized knockoff luxury clothing from back in the day um that various hip-hop artists athletes and gamblers were rocking back then some of them even wore it in their videos as well as to parties and functions so like when people try to tell you don't wear a knockoff so that's your <laughs> i think we should adjust the term knockoff yeah it's not yeah it's not a, not a, not exactly a knockoff they were inspired by items yeah. no this is uh, purposing uh, items yeah he wasn't making from what I understand, he wasn't making Gucci prints. They were buying or getting a hold of, and how is not our business, <laughs> yeah. items, and then <laughs> making them something different. So if you were a person who had enough money to pay him to make a Gucci tire cover for your Jeep, how he got the fabric was not really your business. <laughs> yeah, that is, <laughs> that, yeah, that is very true. Um, have a so, and there's a level of creativity with it that is different than a knockoff. Copyright infringement. Yes. Copyright <laughs> infringement. Yes. He was infringing on a copyright. <laughs> um. Yeah, yeah, he did do that. Went to jail for it and everything, and then they hired him. Yes, <laughs> they did. They brought <laughs> they brought him back. Um. In 2018, he collaborated with Gucci, uh, which I'm I'm happy about that because I believe that um, he contributed so much to the culture. And to your point, um, there is a there is a level of creativity in his design work um, that they tried to discredit um, successfully. I mean, they <laughs> to a certain extent, they successfully tried to discredit him, um, and then. Un, you know, well, not unfortunately, but fortunately for, you know, black designers in general, but also for the black community, um, especially in, in recent years, I think a lot more people uh, within the younger generation are familiar with who Dapper Dan, Dan is and what he's contributed as well. I'd argue that <laughs> he gave some of their stuff swag. That, he took very yeah. simple things <laughs> and flipped it in ways, much like many things that Black people do, and flipped it in a way that was really interesting and really cool and very um, original. Like the idea of taking like a floor suit and being like, oh, I want my name on the back of this suit, but I want yeah. it in Gucci fabric. Huh. How do I make that happen? Mm -hmm. And now when you look at a lot of the Gucci designs in the last few seasons, a lot of it just looks like what he used to make in the 80s. Yes. And they're charging yeah. on and they're charging a lot more for it. Yeah. And and it's not and really different. From, <laughs> a yeah. little bit. Not it's not really different from sampling in music either. I mean, we look at people and we consider them geniuses when they have a a, a, a beat or a, or a remix song where they're again inspired and and taking from 
somebody else's art to reimagine it and recreate it. So that's a, that's a very good point. Yeah. In more black fashion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Look at AI. Well, one, every time I see Alan Iris's face, I blush. <laughs> and she's like, literally kind of gray. That's crazy. That's yeah. nuts. Every day since the first time I saw this man, my cheeks do the same thing. Um, <laughs> yeah. You can see, I mean, this is, you know, this is Alan Iverson shoot, shooting for That's uh, Alan Iverson, y'all. The, the brand Kith. Um, so uh, streetwear brands continue to use black athletes and black musicians, even the ones who that are not black owned because black culture is the culture <laughs> right now. It is the culture and marketing. They continue, you know, streetwear brands continue to use black athletes and musicians to, you know, as a driving force to promote their brands. As you can see, we've got Kith on the left, and then we've, of course, got the Nasty Nas Supreme collaboration on the right. And they will oftentimes also, you know, use Black music as well as AAVE as an anchor for their marketing campaigns. Let's not forget about the Iverson braids, whatever variation there is, too, because I remember that being, like, super... Yes. Popular. I remember having to braid my cousin's hair. Like, can I get the 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 Iverson's? No, I don't want to. Do yeah, that. we could we could we could do, I I could do a webinar on I on Iverson. <laughs> 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 don't, 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 don't get me started. <laughs> uh, fun fact: My aunt, who lives in Virginia, uh, is good friends with AI's mom, and he she at one point used to braid his hair. Yeah. Uh, back when he was in. <laughs> Even in the games, because I remember seeing that too. Yeah. Uh, and I did So more black fashion and aesthetics, of course. We've got Queen B, Beyonce. Um, oh, we're at Ivy Park today. <laughs> we love it. We love it. I mean, when you look at the way that, um, again, black culture and black women and black aesthetics dominate our culture today, Beyonce and Rihanna are definitely two driving forces of that. And if it's not them, it's people trying to emulate, um, especially, especially Beyonce from early on in her career. I think now uh, she's reached a point in her career where um, if, although Ivy Park is not I don't, I don't know if Ivy Park is the biggest brand um, from a from from that standpoint. I think that um, there are a lot of people who still try to emulate certain styles uh, that Beyonce. So I think that what Beyonce is is an example of this. If at first you don't succeed, try try again. I will say this: Beyonce was not known for being a fashion girly or a girl who could dress. <laughs> um, the one on the right. Rihanna dressed down from the beginning, looks, vibes, energy, style, just creative. Because House of Darion. Ivy Park, House, yeah. Ivy Park great. <laughs> House of Darion, the fact that it was in vogue is still shocking to me, but it was beautiful ads, kind of like what Aretha Franklin would say, beautiful <laughs> gown, just beautiful gowns. But it took a while, but it's good that the opportunity because of who she is, how creative she is and who she's married to. Now, if we want to talk about style icons, that one's probably more of if you zoom out like a aesthetic icon than her, but that's a story for another day. But Robin Fenty. Yeah, I, th I think Rihanna has it <laughs> ac across the board. You look at you know the numbers that Fenty Beauty is doing, but you also look at Savage mm -hmm. Fenty. You look at the partnerships with Amazon. I think the Savage uh, the Savage Fenty, uh, the the show that she does, uh, you know, partnered with Amazon has been running for about three or four years now. Um, but to think that Rihanna now has a brand, a lingerie brand, where she's doing uh, fashion, you know, a, a fashion show and partnering with a with a brand as large as Amazon, and you, when you think back to how huge like the Victoria's Secret. Uh, uh, show was for years on years um it's she it's incredible she ate their food by becoming yes. by being smart and savvy 
and inclusive. So if you stick to like the idea of black fashion and aesthetics, the size differential that you see in both Ivy Park and Fenty Beauty is something that doesn't feel put on. And it could be just because culturally there tends to be, there is an embracing of different sizes on the male and female side. If you look at what Fenty has done, and those are underwear fashion shows, and there are people of many different shapes and sizes, yeah. abilities, colors, and it looks cool and creative and interesting. Um, yeah. Uh, I think that that just comes from culture, just kind of being open. There's an openness. Yeah. It's, and yeah. that even ties back to like Dapper Dan. It, the continuous thing is like, for all with creativity, with energy and swag, but like not in like a box because it is no yes. one way to be. And I think some of these folks have been able to leverage that. I think the B people have sometimes with like a, a Supreme or a Kip is that it does feel out of the box. Now yeah. what people do with it turns it around like when they put it on their bodies. But when you look at it, sometimes it does feel a little Especially some of the recent yeah. stuff. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what can you do? So in gaming, I don't know. I, I, I'm a gamer, so like I've been gaming my entire life, and um, I don't remember. For me, as somebody who has gamed throughout their life, I don't remember a time where there was as much of a push push through all of these gaming channels. Um, with black music in the 90s we had you know stuff like we had like the michael jackson game on on the sega genesis we also had um there's another one that's uh, that i'm drawing a blank on but we had a few but now to see like hip-hop artists in actual ad campaigns for some of these huge blockbuster games like call of duty as you, you can see in the image here uh with young thug and gunna uh, starring in the Call of Duty commercial from the last Call of Duty. And this year, Call of Duty had Nicki Minaj and Lil Baby in, in their commercial. Um, and this these are these are video games that traditionally lean heavily towards like rock music um, or EDM. And all of the advertisements now have black music and black creators in, in them. And you can see in the other the other image here, we have Travis Scott getting turned into a Fortnite character while he also, um, on top of that, Fortnite partnered with him and his brand, Cactus Jack, to do a concert inside of the game, Fortnite. Um, and just while we're on the subject of Fortnite and, and marketing in general, when you look at how many dance trends they've taken from TikTok that were made by Black creators to use them inside of this game that they market to little children, um, it really is in, insane when you look at all of the different ways that a lot of people, as they're consuming this content, they're not even thinking about the impact of Black culture and the Black community and Black creators that they are having on the space, you know, and on the content that they're consuming. So it's very interesting to me to see, especially these rappers in the in these commercials um, in, in recent years. And there's also, beyond just the commercials, uh, Twitch is, has partnered with a, an, a, an array of, of rappers. I think uh, rapper T Grizzly from Detroit is one of the more famous ones that has a Twitch channel where he plays Grand Theft Auto that brings in over a million dollars in revenue every month. Um, and so it's it's become a space. The, the gaming community has started to embrace hip hop over the last 20 to 30 years. Um, and I also think it's just that like, the folks who have were heavily into gaming in the 80s and 90s have grown up and we were heavily into the gaming, but we were also heavily into hip hop and that music and that culture. So it's kind of just continued heading in that direction. But it's 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 all it's super interesting to me for me to see now uh black musicians being animated into video games to do concerts. Yeah, I think that this always reminds me of like um, the Def Jam game Fight for New York. And then like some of my other favorites, like NBA Ballers, I always had like a big hip hop influence. And then um, Midnight Club, Double Edition, 
an NBA street car and then race it through the city. <laughs> yeah, I can remember listening to the, to some of those some of those soundtracks from those games, and and some of it some of it was music that I hadn't that that I hadn't experienced um, from but from before my time. So it it definitely over time. Um, the marketing of black culture within within video games has been something interesting to see. And then there's the impact today on social media. Um, so black content creators and consumers play a significant role in driving social media culture by setting trends and shaping conversations on a variety of platforms. Um, of course, we've seen the rise of black influencers, which has challenged traditional beauty standards in media and representation. Um, and black music, fashion, aesthetics, and language are becoming more and more mainstream. Um, for me, uh, I think the first moment, especially on social, when I really started to, so there was a platform at one point called Sconex. I don't know, if, I don't know if everybody remembers Sconex, but Sconex, <laughs> Sconex at one point was almost like MySpace, uh, and it was tailored towards mostly black people um and but i can remember my brother having a sconex but my experience when it came to social and really saying like like we have the power now was with twitter when when i got on twitter in 2009 and seeing like like twitter for most people who are actually on there heavily you know that there is a section just for black twitter um, and you also know that you will go on other platforms, whether it's Instagram, Facebook, um, et cetera, and you will see memes and jokes that you saw on Black Twitter from three weeks ago because they are consistently pushing the culture forward on, on Twitter, or at one point they were. Um, and so that, that was my first moment where I was like, okay, like, there, there's a, a, a really big shift happening on social. But at the same time on Twitter, I was watching, you know, people who were black creators on Twitter that maybe they, they made jokes or they wrote Twitter threads that told these compelling stories. I was watching other people steal their content um, and upload it to Twitter and get thousands of not only thousands of thousands of views and engagement and retweets, but also getting brand deals and <laughs> endorsements for uh, content that they had stolen, um, which we'll of course talk about in the next slide. So one of the things that uh, as, as we've been pushing the culture forward through social platforms, it has been extremely hard for black creators on social media to get their just due and to receive their credit. In the last slide, you saw a young woman dancing who is the creator of the trend on TikTok, the renegade, which is, of course, famous for a ton of white creators on TikTok taking that dance, not giving her credit, using the song, not giving the creators of the song credit and putting out their content. And the dance, of course, went viral. It started trending and nobody knew that this that this girl created it. There were all types of stories about all of these different white creators who they thought were the originators of <laughs> this dance. Yeah, and they ended up on TV and everything. Yes. Um and and rightfully so um the NBA gave her, you know, tried to give her her credit, allowed her to her her to do the dance at the All-Star game a couple of years back. But this is an ongoing problem. We see um brands like Fashion Nova and Shein being accused of stealing designs from smaller boutique black designers on Instagram um, and, and TikTok. And I use the term accused very lightly because when you actually look at the photographs of these designs, they are carbon copies. Um, <laughs> they, are, they are taking these designers work and, and using them as their own. Um, and it, it can be an extremely frustrating. And then we just look at the fact that Again, we, we've been having this conversation around I Pull Rank as an organization about AI and AI generated content. And when we talk about AI and we talk about algorithms, a ton of these algorithms are biased. You know, there, there are studies that have been run on TikTok's algorithm 
um, where they have they have transitioned and they they've worked on the algorithm. And I can remember in 2020 um, there were conversations around racism and classism because TikTok was pushing out videos in which the algorithm could actually tell the skin tone of the person that was recording the video. The algorithm could tell if you had um, it, they, the algorithm could tell if you were in a wealthy household based on the whether or not if you. If you if you had the infamous popcorn ceiling, it would suppress your views because it didn't believe that you lived in a wealthy neighborhood. Um, and so, when you look at that in in its totality, it leads to a place where although Black people are pushing the culture forward on all of these social platforms, we are not receiving the same pay when it comes to our influencer marketing campaigns when we when we join forces with these brands. Um, to of course work with them and market their products. Again, our our compensation for those things does not match, and in some in some cases, our compensation comes down to a pat on the back or uh, exposure. Is another good one that brands like to reach out to black creators and say, "Well, this is a good opportunity for exposure." But again, if you would pay a white creator. Three thousand dollars to post this content on TikTok, then why am I any different? Um, and so it becomes really, really frustrating to see this type of stuff and see the numbers and see the pay disparities. Um, and it just goes to show that, uh, despite the fact that we continue to be the largest uh, group of influencers and that our our culture continues to be used um, for profit, that we still are missing out on a ton of the benefits on how influential um, Black culture really is. Now, one thing I will say to this, and this is something that we can all do, like a, like a little seed, is I think that what we may need to do culturally is release the hiding of things. Um, money is not private. Um, not talking about the rate that you get when you do something, not sharing the rate that you were paid for things whether it be salary or a look like this does not help because if people can trust you to keep it secret, they can offer people anything. The more you know, the more you can ask for. I've heard black creatives specifically talk about that in terms of the need when it, when opportunities come and you are a micro influencer, you probably should check with someone else and be open to be allowed to be checked with and be truthful so that everybody can kind of like like even out things, but if people can trust people to culturally always be like, oh, I'm not talking about money with this one, that one or the third, they can take advantage of you because there's no openness about what's being charged. And that specifically, I've heard that specifically with influencers, you have to start talking about what people are charging. Yeah, I think people have, I think influencers and just creators in general have um, gotten a lot better of being more transparent, but I have a question as far as like, um, what would be a good remedy to kind of stop the the level of, I guess in, in layman's terms, theft, right? Because uh, some people's answer is to just like make our own platform, but I don't necessarily think that's that might be feasible. So I'm just interested to see what anyone's perspective is as far as like, in addition to being transparent, what else can be done? Um, I don't think there's anything that could be done because it's not new if you think about it. Like there's been music been, that have been made by black creators and then repackaged and, and made by people, you know, Elvis and further back. This is what happens. The one thing you can do is since we live in a capitalist society, is at least be paid fairly for your work. Pay, be paid fairly for your work because it's gonna get stolen. Yeah. Because the whole point is, is that this culture becomes broader culture and it's definitely American culture, but it's a less sad story when, you get when you're not you know, left on the side of the road and someone gave you a chicken dinner and took your song, you know, like, yeah. Be, be more, if it's going to be a business, I guess we're going to have to be a little more Vigilant strong about, about the business part. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
this is more better business practices, I would say too. Yeah. Right. Because the opera, because just being allowed in the, because the, there has to be a decision. Do you want to be invited in the room or do you want to be paid fairly? Some people get very excited about being invited in the room and they don't always charge what they should. Yeah. I think a, another thing, you know, Nefrakara is that, um, which is again, one of the reasons why we're doing this webinar is I think we need more black people in these spaces, like outside of the influencer marketing, mm -hmm. we need more black people making the decisions on like reaching out to influencers for, for influencer mm -hmm. campaigns, setting the budget right. for influencer campaigns. Like we are in a space right now where a lot of people are, again, which is not to Sam Tell's point is not new, but a lot of people are benefiting from black culture. And in that regard, there are not a ton of black people in these marketing positions, especially with influencer marketing. Um, when you look at a lot of the people in these roles, they tend to be white or, you know, non-black POCs. And so I think that it would be helpful to have our voices in the rooms as, you know, as these decisions are being made you know, so, so that we could get some semblance and not just with that, but also to the point of like the AI and the algorithms. That's one of the reasons why, like, you know, there, there's such a hard push for black people in tech, because like there, it, there are a lot of ethics questions around these technologies. Um, a lot, a lot of these technologies, again, they are not necessarily that they, they are, they succumb to the biases Guys, based on, yeah. you know, based on the, the people who are actually coding and creating these algorithms. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I, you know, I don't think that that's a permanent fix, but I think it'll br at least level the playing field a little bit, um, which, of course, brings us to black representation and marketing. <laughs> um, and so by the numbers, um, as of 2022, black employees make up 7.2% of the marketing industry's workforce, which is an increase from 6.6% the previous year. Um, a Nielsen study found that only 32% of black audiences, or yeah, 32% of black audiences feel in the, the industry representation of their identity group is accurate. And the growing intersectional identities within the black community make nuanced representation more important than ever. So in short, like from 6.6 .6 to 7.2%, as Jadakiss told Dipset in their verses, it's good, but it's not enough. Like that's <laughs> not really, <laughs> that, that's, that's not moving anything. Um, and as we can continue to talk about marketing, you know, I've got, uh, this image here from Boomerang, which if you haven't seen the movie, go see, see it. But Eddie Murphy works at a marketing agency in that. In that. Everybody <laughs> black in the movies in the 90s working at a marketing agency. Yes. Uh, yeah, we were talking friends. about XXL mm -hmm. and um, I was watching Brown Sugar the other day with my with my girlfriend and Sanaa Lathan, so her character works at she's the editor in chief at XXL in that in that movie. So like all of these different you know marketing pieces, it, it continues to be in black media throughout the entire time. So while black representation in the marketing industry has increased, it is still underrepresented uh, compared to the their group proportions in the overall U.S. population. And so we have some resources for black marketers and that we'd like to share. One of them is the Black Global Career Network, which is a Facebook group with over 60,000 members that is set out to empower black people to find their authentic self while managing their careers in predominantly white spaces. Get on this because I joined the group. They post jobs from black owned businesses. They are consistently providing networking opportunities. So. Um, it's definitely a good free resource for you, um, as well as the Black Career Network, which is a network uh, for the Black community to find and post available jobs, as well as attend career events. Um, and that is also a network where they post a ton of Black-owned businesses. So please use that resource. 
Um, some paid resources um, is the Black Marketers Association of America, as well as the African American Marketing Association. Um, and these platforms are open to anybody who wants to get into marketing or is in a marketing in a marketing role, whether it's social media or SEO um, or advertising. Um, so I would definitely advise you join those, get connected with it, with uh, get connected with some folks that are in an industry that you hope to be in. And then finally, as we've discussed throughout this, it can be difficult to navigate this landscape as a whole. We've been having this conversation all month. Um, so one of the major mental health resources is BEAM, which is the Black Emotional and Mental Health Collective. It's an online directory of licensed Black therapists who are certified to provide telemental health services. So if you're not leaving the house or you're unable to find Black therapists in your area, this is a great resource for you. Um, and we also have launched our IPR Black 365 page on our website where you can find the resources that I just mentioned, as well as podcast episodes, as well as webinars on Black culture and marketing, and some resources there, some extra resources for mental health, as well as Black professionals and marketers and Black folks who are trying to get into tech. Because as we mentioned before, there are not enough of us in the space. Please, thank you guys for joining us. Please, please follow us, particularly on the social networks that we are most active on. LinkedIn. When you say us, you mean I pull rank, right? I, yes, I mean I mean I mean I pull <laughs> I pull rank. <laughs> Absolutely. Like you can also follow me on LinkedIn. Like I again, like I, I'm posting a lot this year we're talking a lot about seo we're talking about a, a i need to be posting here. more but <laughs> i still not i have no <sighs> i don't want to waste people's time with things that are just trite so i'm trying to become inspired to say things that are interesting <clears throat> and valuable and useful yeah. so we can have conversations i would like to talk to people more using linkedin but i don't know somebody send me some ideas go to my linkedin and yeah. Tell me what I'm what I should be posting about and then I'll post Absolutely. About it. Absolutely. Reach out know. and talk and well. <laughs> no, 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 no. You can reach out and you can reach no, out to me. Yeah, um, tell him yeah, what you're doing. Reach out to my full rank page. Yeah. Um, yeah. Tell them. Yeah. And then yeah. I'll do it if Aaron says do it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I, you know, of course, on LinkedIn, I talk a lot about marketing. I talk a lot about SEO and I, I share a lot of the good resources that we have on our website, on iPolRank's website for uh, people looking to learn marketing. So definitely follow me, follow the iPolRank pages. Check out the check out our YouTube channel as well. There's amazing content on SEO, especially if you're just learning and trying to get into things like SEO and content marketing. There are a slew of resources that we have available. We have a ton of content for you in that respect. So this has been an incredible web webinar. There are so many good things that I can take from here um, and use as clips on social <laughs> and uh continue con continue yeah, clip that i don't like dj envy yeah. <laughs> oh no, oh, no. <laughs> brand doesn't like no. DJ envy. <laughs> no i'm not i'm not gonna i'm not gonna clip that but <laughs> not that clip that for real but next I think year's black time. history stuff is gonna be all hosted by dj envy and i'll have to be like oh my god i'm so excited to work with you uh. <laughs> 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 I think there's not. a lot that people <laughs> folks can learn from this webinar, especially for, for you know, maybe some Black people who are thinking about uh, marketing as an option in their career. Like, there is a wealth of contributions. It is, it is an industry that um, we have helped shape. And so I think that um, there's a, a wealth of information here that people can take, you can be inspired by. Um, and I, I hope that the webinar, I hope everybody learned something new about how Black culture has and continues to influence and impact the marketing industry. So this has been an I Pull Rank webinar.
It has been beautiful. Thank you to all of those who have come and commented. I saw some comments on LinkedIn. Thank you to everybody for coming. I just need comments. Um, yeah, this is some, some some folks were commenting, especially during the Jet Magazine uh, conversation. There were some folks commenting on there. So thank you for the comments. Thank you for coming to the webinar. Thank you for listening to us speak about the way in which the culture has been completely influential in this industry. So. We'll see you next month. Thanks, guys. Have a month. Bye. Bye.